This is Randy Shell, and I'm making a video cast on cardiovascular pharmacology and it's a keyword based review as part of our University of Kentucky College of Medicine Anesthesiology Didactics. For those who want a very in-depth discussion of this topic I would recommend Clinical Anesthesia Bearish 8th edition, the Pharmacology chapter, chapter 13, Stolting's Physiology and Pharmacology 5th edition, and Clinical Anesthesia Fundamentals Bearish from 2015, Cardiovascular Pharmacology. But we're going to focus in on the American Board of Anesthesia published keywords since 2010 on the topic Cardiovascular Pharmacology. If you take all of those keywords, you can put them under categories inotropes, milrinone, vasopressors, vasodilators, ACE and ARBs, antianginals, beta blockers, antiarrhythmics, and an other category. In the graphic here you can see that the green keywords are from 2015 and 2016 and the purple ones are from the most recent two years 2017 and 2018. Under inotropes, a common topic, bradycardia and heart transplant. The transplanted heart still has beta receptors and can respond to beta agonists like isoproteranol and epinephrine. And digoxin toxicity is another common one. Under milrinone, the cardiovascular effects of this phosphodiesterase type 3 inodilator uh, medication. Under vasopressors, lots of questions on vasopressin, its mechanism of action. The fact that it tends to work a little better than catecholamines in an acidotic state. And its cardiovascular effects, mainly the V1 receptor mediated vasoconstriction that occurs when vasopressin is administered. And the fact that in the case of septic shock and severe hypotension and vasoplegia, especially associated with uh, ACE inhibitors for example, vasopressin has uh, beneficial effects. Under vasodilators you can see nitroprusside, nitroglycerin, phenoldepam, inhaled nitric oxide, and the phosphodesterase type 5 inhibitor, sildenafil, which is used for reducing pulmonary vascular resistance in patients with pulmonary hypertension. ACE and ARBs, the mechanism of ACE inhibitors, how they work, and some of the side effects such as cough and angioedema. Antianginals, how beta blockers uh, reduce angina and under antiarrhythmics, mainly questions related to amiodarones, how it works, some of the side effects of it, and the management of torsades. Prostaglandin E1 is used to keep the ductus open in patients with congenital heart disease and it's discussed under the congenital heart disease uh, didactic section. Let's start right in on inotropes and look at the graphic on the far right specifically focusing on the red stars and the red boxes. If you look at beta adrenergic agonists they work through uh, the beta 1 receptor in the case of inotropy, to mediate via G protein an increase in cyclic AMP inside the uh, muscle of the heart. When cyclic AMP goes up, calcium comes in, and with increased calcium within inside the uh, myocardial cell, there's increased contraction of the heart. So inotropy is increased via beta-1 agonism. Digoxin is also shown up at the top. Uh, mainly historical because it's not used very much anymore, but digoxin works differently by inhibiting the sodium potassium ATPase such that normally this enzyme pumps sodium out and pumps potassium in to keep the ions on the right side of the uh, membrane. But when it's poisoned, sodium builds up inside the cell and then the sodium calcium exchanger kicks in move sodium out and calcium inside. So again, the mechanism of the potential inotropy of digoxin is via calcium. When you look at milrinone, you can see that it inhibits phosphodiesterase, the enzyme that breaks down cyclic AMP to AMP. So if you inhibit this enzyme, the cyclic AMP that is formed inside the cell is not broken down as much and therefore it has greater effect that is calcium effect inside and inotropy. So when we look at inotropes such as epinephrine which works via multiple receptors, dobutamine, 
dopamine, milrinone. Uh, these are our classic inotropes. In the case of epinephrine, its beta-1 effects are uh, what we focus on when we talk about inotropy. And within the case of dobutamine, it has beta-1 and beta-2 effects. Dopamine, D1, B1, and A1, but at mid-dose range, we talk about its beta-1 effects. And milrinone, not a beta-1 agonist, but an inodilator, specifically its phosphodiesterase type 3 inhibition, inhibiting the breakdown of cyclic AMP. Now these catecholamines have to be administered uh, intravenously as a continuous infusion, and the reason for that is exogenous catecholamines are rapidly metabolized by uh, mainly catechol-O-methyltransferase, or COMPT. Endogenous catecholamines like epinephrine and norepinephrine, when they're released from a nerve terminal, are rapidly taken back up and broken down by monamine oxidase. Let's next focus on beta-1 and beta-2 effects. When a beta agonist binds to a beta receptor in the cell membrane, these beta receptors can be present in upregulated and downregulated conditions. In upregulated conditions, such as when someone's on a beta blocker, or downregulated conditions when there's lots of exogenous catecholamines around being administered, or a high sympathetic tone state, the beta receptors may downregulate. So these beta receptors can change in number, but when the beta agonist binds to it, in the case of the beta-1 effect, you can see that um, cyclic AMP goes up, calcium channel activation occurs, more calcium inside the cell, and you get that positive inotropy, and you also get positive chronotropy from beta-1 effect. So the heart beats faster, it beats harder, and one that's not mentioned here is it relaxes faster. So lucitropy, or you could say diastolic function is improved with uh, beta agonist effect. Beta-2 effects, we think of, yes, being cyclic AMP mediated, but in this case, there's augmented calcium uptake by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. In usually we think of the vascular uh, uh, smooth muscle of muscles, and it vasodilates. So beta-1 effect, heartbeat stronger and faster, beta-2 effect, vasodilation. In the case of digitalis, which is a cardiac glycoside that inhibits the enzyme sodium-potassium ATPase, it, by inhibiting the sodium-potassium ATPase and resulting in more sodium inside the cell, and then the sodium-calcium sodium coupler, that is, uh, resulting in more calcium inside the cell, the heart can beat stronger. It doesn't work via the beta-1 receptor. What do we use digitalis for? Occasionally, patients are on digitalis to slow the AV node in the case of supraventricular dysrhythmias. Patients with atrial fibrillation, uh, digitalis can slow the ventricular response. Rarely is it used anymore for its inotropic effect like it was in the past. DIG has a very low therapeutic index, and DIG toxicity can present with visual changes, nausea and vomiting, GI upset, cardiac dysrhythmias, uh, rhythm disorders, and one of the issues with digoxin is that DIG binds to the sodium potassium ATPase, and it's that potassium binding site that if we can fix uh, coexisting hypokalemia uh, that may be associated with the DIG toxicity, we can reduce DIG toxicity. So one of the treatments for DIG toxicity is fix hypokalemia, give potassium. There are DIG binding antibodies, digibind, that can be administered uh, to uh, get rid of the digoxin, another treatment for digoxin toxicity, and magnesium and dilantin are uh, treatments for some of the dysrhythmias associated with DIG toxicity. So the diagnosis of DIG toxicity often is the fact that it's associated with cardiac dysrhythmias in patients who are taking DIG, maybe took too much of it, have uh, ditch toxicity because of its low therapeutic index and get things like conduction delay, delays, heart block, and ventricular uh, dysrhythmias that um, in the case of uh, shocking, if they be 
need the uh, defibrillation or cardioversion, there's risks of putting that patient into a malignant dysrhythmia if you shock, for example, a uh, rhythm that is uh, such as atrial fibrillation with high shocking energy, you can shock them into something that becomes very difficult to get them out of. So lots of problems with uh, digitalis. Epinephrine, beta-1, beta-2, alpha-1 agonist. At low doses of epinephrine, it tends to hit the beta receptor and you get tachycardia, maybe even a little vasodilation from the beta-2 effect. But at higher doses of epinephrine, we get the vasoconstriction. Epinephrine is classically used for things like anaphylaxis, where via its alpha-1 effect, when a patient's hypotensive during an anaphylactic episode, the alpha receptor agonism results in vasoconstriction and increases mean arterial pressure and decreases mucosal edema associated with the anaphylaxis. And the beta-2 effect from the epinephrine results in bronchodilation uh, treating the wheezing that's often associated with anaphylaxis and stabilizes the mast cells that are releasing the junk from inside them during the anaphylactic episode and uh, reduces the amount of uh, substances that are released from mast cells and stops the anaphylactic episode. Cardiac arrest, epinephrine is used to provide requisite vasoconstriction to improve organ blood flow during chest compressions and it has to be repetitively administered a milligram every about three to five minutes during that time of chest compressions. During local anesthetic toxicity or LAST, it is recommended that the epinephrine dose be reduced to less than one mic per kilogram. Um, and this is a much reduced dose as compared to what is normally recommended during ACLS resuscitation when chest compressions are being given. Bradycardia and hypotension, if you have a denervated heart, for example, that uh, no longer has innervation from the vagus nerve or T1 through T4 sympathetics, it's called denervated. And this would be the heart transplant patient. If they become bradycardic, the heart still has beta receptors on it. In fact, those beta receptors often upregulate and will respond to beta agonists. So epinephrine, isoproterenol, Drugs with beta-1 effects can often increase the heart rate in these patients. Epinephrine is used for treatment of severe asthma to cause bronchodilation via its beta-2 effects and uh, to prolong local anesthetic action because it vasoconstricts and reduces uptake of the local anesthetic from the point of injection. Some of the side effects of epinephrine raises blood sugar, drives potassium into the cell, and can cause uh, arrhythmias. Dobutamine is not a, um, a substance that our body makes. It's synthetic and has effects on beta-1 and beta-2 receptor. So if it stimulates the beta-1 receptor, it's going to make the heartbeat stronger, increase contractility or inotropy, and via its beta-2 receptor agonism, it decreases systemic vascular resistance or dilates blood vessels. So it's called an ino dilator, another inodilator that works via phosphodiesterase inhibi inhibition is milrinone. Dobutamine can cause significant tachycardia via its beta-1 effects and that's what you often see when you start 2.5 to 5 mics per kilo per minute of dobutamine. You can see this tachycardia. In fact, during stress echocardiography, when you're doing dobutamine stress echoes, it is the increase in heart rate and the increased contractility that results in demand for more oxygen to, to the heart and you get demand myocardial ischemia and new wall motion abnormalities, walls that aren't moving in the uh, echo exam that indicate coronary artery disease. So dobutamine is used for stress echo. It used to be used for treatment of patients with congestive heart failure but its use was linked to increased morbidity and mortality and it's no longer recommended for this. Dobutamine increases the cardiac output through its inotropy and increased contractility, beta-1 effect, and can decrease pulmonary vascular resistance via its beta-2 effect and uh, 
Occasionally it's used in patients with pulmonary hypertension because of its beta-2 effect in decreasing pulmonary vascular resistance. So when we think of dobutamine, we should think of a synthetic catecholamine that increases heart rate and contractility in that it's an inodilator. Norepinephrine uh, is a potent vasoconstrictor. It works via the alpha-1 receptor for this vasoconstriction, but it also is an agonist at the beta-1 receptor, so it has some inotropy. It does not work at the beta-2 receptor, so you would not use it as a bronchodilator, for example. If you look at the graphic on the far right, you can see the mechanism of alpha agonism. Alpha agonists bind to the alpha-1 receptor on the cell membrane, vascular smooth muscle, for example, and the G protein again uh, eventually results in this case increased calcium inside the cell and with increased calcium inside that vascular smooth muscle it results in vasoconstriction. We use norepinephrine in septic shock often as the drug of choice vasopressin can be added occasionally to norepinephrine to increase blood pressure or decrease the total norepinephrine dose you need to maintain blood pressure during septic shock. But uh, norepinephrine is usually the drug of choice for patients in septic shock. It also is used in vasoplegic syndromes where the patients are massively vasodilated, for example, after long periods of cardiopulmonary bypass, refractory hypotension. The problems with norepinephrine is that, like epinephrine, it, it can cause dysrhythmias and it can increase pulmonary vascular resistance because of its potent alpha-1 agonism. And it also constricts the blood vessels to the kidney and to the gut and reduces blood flow to the kidney and the gut. Isoproterenol mainly has historical uh, importance, but is occasionally used in the uh, cardiac lab uh, for a cardiac ablations of dysrhythmias. Isoproterenol has beta-1 and beta-2 effects um, and because of its beta-1 effect it's going to increase the heart rate and contractility and via its beta-2 effect it's going to cause vasodilation. In the past it was used to increase the heart rate after cardiac transplantation. In that denervated heart that has beta receptors, isoproterenol could increase the heart rate if, it was, if the patient was bradycardic. It also has been used in the past for RV failure to stimulate contractility of the right heart in patients with pulmonary hypertension because the beta-2 effect caused a dilation of the pulmonary vessels. And so you had increased contractility of the right heart with dilation of the pulmonary vasculature and uh, could potentially benefit those type of patients. Lots of problems with isoproterenol, however. It increases the heart rate and increases the contractility and makes the heart use a lot more oxygen. And because of its beta-2 effect, it drops the blood pressure, drops the diastolic blood pressure. You can see that if the heart rate is up, uh, there's less diastolic time for the heart to be perfused, uses more oxygen. If the diastolic blood pressure is down because of the vasodilation, the coronary perfusion goes down. And if the contractility is up, it uses more oxygen. So myocardial ischemia can result from administration of isoproterenol. It also causes tachydysrhythmias. And you may be asked to infuse isoproterenol doing, uh, uh, during EPS studies in the cath lab, for example, to facilitate a diagnosis of a dysrhythmia or a pathway uh, that is causing a dysrhythmia. Dopamine is an agonist at multiple receptors, D1 receptor or dopamine 1 receptor at low dose. We think of it as increasing blood flow to the kidney. Um, B1 receptor, beta receptor, at mid-dose increases contractility and at high doses the alpha-1 receptor and resulting in vasoconstriction. That D1 receptor, when it's agonized, results in diuresis and natiuresis and increases renal blood flow. Renal dose dopamine, however, um, in meta-analysis studies, looking back at all of these studies that have tried to use dopamine to improve uh, renal function and to stop renal failure after uh, types of surgery, such as heart surgery and in the intensive care unit, 
It's been shown to not improve renal failure outcomes in these situations, and therefore renal dose dopamine that we used to use in the past has gone away. Side effects of a dopamine include dysrhythmias, tachycardia, and in fact, even though we teach oftentimes this graded effect from low dose causing dopaminergic effects, mid dose, uh, beta 1 effects, and high dose alpha 1 effects, they often cross over. And these are artificial dosing at 2.5 and the 5 to 10 and the greater than 10 mics per kilo causing, causing the alpha 1 effects that we classically teach. Oftentimes you can see tachycardia even at those quotes D1 or uh, dopaminergic effects. And dopamine can worsen myocardial ischemia. Sympathomimetics, ephedrine, we classically reach for in a patient who's hypotensive and bradycardic in the operating room. Um, it causes both direct and indirect effects. Its indirect effect is to cause presynaptic release of norepinephrine. Its direct effect is to bind to alpha and beta receptors. So if you have uh, increased alpha agonism and beta agonism, you can see how the heart rate would go up from the beta agonism, the cardiac output from the beta agonism, and the SVR would go up because of the alpha agonism. One of the problems with ephedrine is with repetitive doses, the effect becomes less, and that is tachyphylaxis. So I said the first dose of five mics or five milligrams of ephedrine results in tachycardia and an increase in blood pressure. And as you continue to give doses, you get less blood pressure and heart rate effects from that ephedrine. As mentioned, we use ephedrine frequently to treat hypotension that's accompanied by a decreased heart rate. And some of the problems with ephedrine include the fact that it is releasing indirectly norepinephrine from the presynaptic um, uh, neuron. In the case of uh, pheochromocytoma and patients on MAOI inhibitors, ex uh, MAOI inhibitors are inhibiting the breakdown of presynaptic catecholamines, and you can see how ephedrine might cause a massive release then of norepinephrine, and we wouldn't use ephedrine in patients on MAOI inhibitors or pheochromocytoma for that matter. Phenylephrine, direct alpha-1 vasoconstriction. It will increase both preload and afterload, and it has a large effect on preload. And if it constricts the capacitance vessels, blood goes uh, to the heart and preload goes up, and um, you can get an increase in blood pressure and often a reflex decrease in heart rate. In fact, as you give phenylephrine frequently, you'll see your EKG uh, heart rate go down, and then when your blood pressure co cuff comes up, your blood pressure has gone up, let's say, from 70 systolic when you gave phenylephrine up to 140, and then your heart rate reflexively decreases. But phenylephrine, because of its constriction of the capacitance vessels, has a large effect on preload and it constricts these uh, splanchnic renal and skeletal muscle vessels and uh, preload goes up. However, you can imagine if you had a patient with bad heart, low ejection fraction, congestive heart failure, and you uh, increased preload and increased afterload, uh, this would be not a great way to treat hypotension in a patient with a bad heart and can result in a decrease in cardiac output and phenylephrine, because of its alpha-1 effects, like norepinephrine, can increase pulmonary vascular resistance. So someone with pulmonary hypertension administering uh, drugs with strong alpha-1 effects could potentially have a negative effect on pulmonary vascular resistance. Milrinone inhibits phosphodiesterase, so it doesn't work via the beta receptor, but inhibits cyclic AMP breakdown. So as the graphic shows on the far right, as norepinephrine uh, binds to, for example, the beta-1 receptor, um, and uh, epinephrine binds to both uh, beta-1 and beta-2 receptor, beta receptors via G protein result in increased intracellular cyclic AMP, and then increased calcium. That cyclic AMP is broken down by phosphodiesterase, and if you have a phosphodiesterase inhibitor like milrinone going at the same time, you can see how you can get a synergistic effect between exogenously administered catecholamines like epinephrine and, phos and a phosphodiesterase inhibitor like milrinone. And that's why we combine those frequently 
uh, for patients with bad heart function, for example, after cardiopulmonary bypass and heart surgery. PDE3 inhibition, the phosphodesterase type 3 is inhibited by melanone and inotropy is increased and it also uh, causes increased relaxation of the heart or lusotropy. PD5 inhibitors like sildenafil uh, cause vasodilation of the vascular smooth muscle and can drop pulmonary vascular resistance and sildenafil may be administered not only for erectile dysfunction but also for patients with pulmonary hypertension. Clinically, milrinone, if it's given as a rapid bolus, can result in vasodilation and hypotension. And on the bottom right graphic, you can see that um, the uh, phosphodesterase inhibitors can result in increased cyclic GMP and relaxation of blood vessels and that is how phosphodesterase type 5 inhibitor results in relaxation of blood vessels and vasodilation of the systemic pulmonary vasculature or the erectile uh, blood vessels and increasing blood flow. If you bolus melanone, you can get that vasodilation and hypotension and therefore it's not the initial drug of choice for patients with uh, left or right heart failure who are also concomitantly hypotensive. For example, if the blood pressure is 65 over 40 and you have a bad heart function, if you bolus dose milrinone, you're going to drop the blood pressure even more and epinephrine instead would usually be the choice uh, for treatment of the hypotension with concomitant LV or RV failure. Milrinone is often used for patients with pulmonary hypertension and RV failure because it drops the pulmonary vascular resistance and helps the right heart beat stronger. And used synergistically with a beta-1 agonist like epinephrine or norepinephrine for helping wean from cardiopulmonary bypass. Vasopressin in the graphic on the far right is shown to be uh, released uh, from the uh, uh, posterior pituitary and have its effect at V1 and V2 receptors. Uh, arginine vasopressin is released in response to hypotension, it's released in response to hyperosmolarity and hypovolemia. Now when vasopressin is released and binds to a V1 receptor, it increases calcium inside uh, vascular smooth muscle and causes vasoconstriction. And so therefore, we use vasopressin to result in V1 mediated rather than alpha 1 receptor mediated vasoconstriction. If arginine vasopressin binds to a V2 receptor, that's the mechanism for um, increasing uh, blood volume through its ADH effect. And um, it is the V1 receptor effect that we're utilizing when we administer vasopressin in hypotensive patients, such as the vasopressin deficiency states like sepsis and vasodilatory shock and catecholamine refractory hypotension and patients that have been administered ACE or ARB inhibitors uh, perioperatively and then get hypotensive. Vasopressin is especially useful in those situations to raise blood pressure via the V1 receptor effect rather than the alpha receptor effect. It's no longer recommended in ACLS cardiac arrest uh, to supply the requisite vasoconstriction that improves organal blood flow during chest compressions. Historically, we used to give 40 units of vasopressin and it had a longer half-life than epinephrine, uh, which had to be administered every three to five minutes. It's not that car vasopressin doesn't work, they've just simplified the ACLS cardiac arrest algorithm which includes epinephrine now rather uh, than epinephrine and or vasopressin. Vasopressin is contraindicated in local anesthetic systemic toxicity and remember that low doses of epinephrine less than one mic per kilo are used in those situations. And there was some evidence from uh, dog studies that pulmonary um, uh, hemorrhaging occurred when these uh, drug was used and um, vasopressin is contraindicated. Vasopressin tends to have less effect on the pulmonary vascular resistance than does norepinephrine. So a patient with pulmonary hypertension who's hypotensive 
um, uh, vasopressin may be administered um, instead of a drug, for example, like norepinephrine. And in the case of an acidotic state, let's say your pH is 7.1 or 7.2, and you know that your catecholamines don't work as well in the acidotic state, vasopressin may work a little bit better. So if you line up our drugs um, here with vasoconstriction, phenylephrine and vasopressin there up at the top, vasodilation, we're going to talk a little bit about nitroprusside, and then the drugs with inotropy, norepinephrine, a potent vasoconstrictor, high-dose epinephrine, uh, a potent vasoconstrictor, and then you can see the inodilators such as dobutamine and milrinone. Um, and uh, hopefully this graphic can help you see when we choose drugs uh, for resuscitating patients what the major effect is going to be, whether it's vasoconstriction, vasodilation, inotropy, or some mix of such. In fact, when you have uh, a pathophysiology, uh, like either a pre-pump problem, like hypovolemia, or a pump problem where the heart's not beating very well, or a post-pump problem uh, where the patient is massively vasodilated, you can match the medication to what the physiology is. In fact, in the case of a pre-pump problem, crystalloid and colloid giving volume would be indicated if the patient's hypotensive, but phenylephrine can constrict the uh, capacitance vessels and increase preload. In the case of a pump problem, you need more contractility, dobutamine, epinephrine, dopamine, uh, and milrinone can be used. And if it's a post-pump problem like massive vasodilation and vasoplegia, we reach for drugs with alpha-1 effects, phenylephrine, vasopressin with its V1 effect, norepinephrine with its potent alpha-1 effect. Let's talk about vasodilators now, the nitrovasodilators, nitroglycerin first, and the graphic on the far right shows how sodium nitroprusside and nitroglycerin simplistically release nitric oxide, increase cyclic GMP, and when cyclic GMP goes up, um, there is calcium reuptake in the smooth muscle, and when calcium is taken back up, there's vasodilation. Nitroglycerin dilates venules more than arterioles and therefore preload is going to go down. It also decreases pulmonary vascular resistance. When used to treat myocardial uh, ischemia, its major effect is because it venodilates and decreases left ventricular end diastolic volume and therefore left ventricular end diastolic pressure and improves endocardial um, uh, blood flow. It also dilates coronary arteries. Now, in a hypovolemic patient, if you give uh, nitroglycerin, you can see how it may precipitate hypotension because it decreases preload. So Danafil, um, if combined with nitroglycerin, can cause severe hypotension. Therefore, the recommendation that patients taken so Danafil not be given nitroglycerin also. Tachyphylaxis can occur, that is, if you administer it over a long period of time, you may need higher doses to get the same effect. And nitroglycerin is metabolized um, uh, to uh, methemoglobin, that is a nitrite which can convert oxyhemoglobin to methemoglobin. And the treatment for methemoglobinemia, as you probably remember, is methylene blue. Nitroprusside is an arterial vasodilator more than venous uh, dilator. It has an extremely fast onset, and we use it for hypertensive emergencies uh, to drop the blood pressure, but it's also used for the medical management of insufficient uh, valves, such as severe aortic insufficiency or severe mitral regurgitation. If you decrease afterload, you can decrease the amount of regurgitation as you're managing the patient and often preparing them possibly for heart surgery. Some of the issues with nitroprusside, one, as you turn it on and drop the blood pressure, reflex tachycardia can occur. And if you want to block that, nitroprusside can be combined with esmolol. When you turn on nitroprusside, it uh, increases physiologic dead space by decreasing uh, the P little a and increasing zone one of the lung and inhibits hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction such that if you had a patient on one lung ventilation and turned on nitroprusside, your P little AO2 may drop. 
It's contraindicated in patients with myocardial ischemia because it can cause uh, reflex tachycardia, a drop in diastolic blood pressure, coronary steel, all bad things for a patient with myocardial ischemia. It's metabolized to cyanide, and cyanide toxicity can occur when nitroprusside is infusing, especially when it's infusing at high doses or long periods of time. If a patient is requiring more and more uh, of nitroprusside in higher doses to get the same effect, that is tachyphylaxis, that is one of the uh, things that occurs uh, uh, to help with the diagnosis of cyanide toxicity. If you are uh, seeing an increasing metabolic acidosis on your blood gases and an increased mixed venous oxygen because the tissues are being um, poisoned in their ability to use oxygen. So if the tissues don't use oxygen because they're being poisoned by cyanide, the cytochrome A, A3 oxidase electron transport chain is being poisoned, the oxygen just goes to the tissues and comes right back to the central circulation and the mixed venous oxygen, let's say, goes up from 65% normal to 90%. Inability to utilize oxygen. Sign of cyanide toxicity. Well, how do you treat cyanide toxicity? The graphic on the left first shows that nitroprusside is broken down to free cyanide. And then the way that we can get rid of free cyanide is one, it can bind to methemoglobin and form cyanomethemoglobin. It can uh, bind um, to uh, a sulfur and form thiocyanate and be renally excreted. And the real problem with cyanide is shown in the uh, yellow that it can inactivate, inactivate cytochrome oxidases and such that you cannot utilize oxygen at the tissue level. So the treatment of nitroprusside toxicity is uh, several different medications that can be supplied in a cyanide antidote package. And amyl nitrate is one of those because amyl nitrate can convert oxyhemoglobin to methemoglobin. You got lots of hemoglobin in your body. And so if you have some of it in the methemoglobin form, which can bind cyanide, you can get rid of that free cyanide molecule and convert it to cyanomethemoglobin. Sodium thiol sulfate is a way to provide uh, sulfur to this hepatic rhodinase enzyme that takes thiosulfate um, and the cyanide ion, combines the sulfur with the cyanide, forms thiocyanate, and if you have a good kidney, you can get rid of uh, the cyanide um, uh, molecule by combining it with sulfur and excreting it and reducing the toxicity. So amyl nitrate, sodium nitrate to convert oxyhemoglobin to methemoglobin, and sodium thiosulfate to provide sulfur to convert it to thiocyanate. Occasionally, uh, you need to give hyperbaric oxygen for treatment of cyanide toxicity, which is also a treatment for carbon monoxide poisoning, hyperbaric oxygen, that is. Vasodilators, another vasodilator is hydrolyzine. It's a direct vasodilator of our arteries and arterioles and increases uh, uh, relaxation of cerebral vessels, coronary vessels, splenic vessels, renal vessels. It drops the vascular resistance and the blood pressure, and its mechanism is by reducing calcium in vascular smooth muscle. Uh, as blood pressure goes down, reflexive tachycardia can occur, um, and increased myocardial oxygen requirements can uh, be precipitated and ischemia even possible. We use hydrolyzine in the perioperative period uh, especially in the recovery room for post-operative hypertension uh, when the patient is not tachycardic and doesn't have a history of myocardial ischemia. Nicardipine, a calcium channel blocker, specific for vascular smooth muscle. It dilates arterial vessels. It decreases blood pressure without as much reflex tachycardia than nitroprusside. It's also a coronary vasodilator, and unlike diltiazem or verapamil, which block the SA or AV nodes and are used to slow ventricular response, for example, during uh, atrial fibrillation, diltiazem is often administered, this nicardipine works on vascular smooth muscle, so it dilates the blood vessels without blocking the SA or AV node, and is used to treat uh, sustained perioperative hypertension. Phenoldepam 
is a selective D1 agonist and works at the D1 receptor and as it binds to that D1 receptor it causes vasodilation of blood vessels like the renal system, the mesenteric system. It doesn't have significant D2 effects, alpha effects, or beta 2 effects and doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier and mainly it was used in the past to drop blood pressure it's infused, it vasodilates, drops the blood pressure, but it also increases renal blood flow, GFR, and sodium excretion. So it was thought to potentially uh, save the kidneys, uh, and you could treat a hypertensive patient, drop their blood pressure, but improve, improve renal blood flow. Unfortunately, it hasn't been shown, um, kind of like dopamine hasn't been shown, to improve a renal blood flow or to save kidneys. It has been shown to improve renal blood flow, but not to save kidneys under those situations. So phenoldepam to treat hypertension um, and also increases renal blood flow, but doesn't improve renal failure outcomes uh, when used in the perioperative period. Inhaled nitric oxide selectively dilates pulmonary vasculature. And the graphic on the far right shows nitric oxide coming down into an alveolus and then resulting in vasodilation of the endothelial cells and the blood vessels going past that alveolus and it's a selective pulmonary vasodilator used to treat patients with pulmonary hypertension and right heart failure. It is cyclic GMP mediated. Remember that uh, many of our vasodilators like nitroglycerin and nitroprusside work through cyclic GMP. It improves uh, ventilation and perfusion matching and um, it has a very short half-life because as you inhale it and it results in the vasodilation of the alveolar capillaries it then binds to the hemoglobin that's going by that alveolar um, uh, uh, capillary unit and when it binds to hemoglobin it's inactivated so as it goes through the lung and gets into the left atrium left ventricle and out in the systemic circulation it's already bound to uh, hemoglobin and it's not going to dilate the systemic vascular resistance. Therefore, it's a selective pulmonary vasodilator. Some toxicity effects is one that it's rapidly metabolized to methemoglobin. So methemoglobinemia can occur. It causes some immunosuppression and uh, platelet adhesion and aggregation. And if you discontinue inhaled nitric oxide uh, from, let's say, 40 parts per million to zero, you can get a rebound effect and an increased pulmonary vascular resistance and decreased PaO2 and it's not recommended to just suddenly shut off nitric oxide but to titrate it off over a period of time. Alpha blockers, there are alpha-1 antagonists. Remember phenylephrine is an alpha-1 agonist. Phentolamine, phenoxybenzamine are alpha-1 antagonists. In the case of phentolamine, it's competitive in the case of phenoxybenzamine, it's non-competitive. Now, why would we ever use these drugs? Often for patients with pheochromocytoma, if you want alpha-1 blockade, these are drugs that are used for it. Labetalol uh, not only has beta-1 uh, selective beta antagonism, but, alpha el but also alpha blocking effects. So when you give labetalol, you're decreasing cardiac contractility, and uh, vasodilating the patient. It has little effect on cerebral blood flow and intracranial pressure, so if someone has high ICP and is also hypertensive, uh, unlike nitroglycerin and nitroprusside, it doesn't raise the cerebral blood flow and ICP. It has little effect on hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, so in that case of uh, a patient on one lung ventilation, um, if you turned on nitroglycerin and nitroprusside and caused vasodilation of blood vessels and inhibition of HPV, you would reduce your PaO2 under that situation, but labetalol would have little effect in that situation. So a hypertensive, one long ventilation patient, labetalol would have less effect on PaO2. Don't get mixed up with clonidine and dexmedetomidine, which are alpha-2 agonists, rather antagonists, and clonidine and dexmedetomidine, because of their alpha-2 agonism presynaptically, they decrease release of norepinephrine. They're not an alpha blocker. Let's 
Switch to angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and ARBs now. Angiotensinogen is formed in the liver. Renin from the kidney converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. And then the enzyme angiotensin converting enzyme in the lung converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, which then has an effect of increasing aldosterone and sodium reabsorption and vasoconstriction. Now, ACE inhibitors also inhibit the breakdown of bradykinins, which are vasodilators. And so ACE inhibitors work through several mechanisms. One of the main ones is this bradykinin effect, uh, resulting uh, if you have more bradykinin around, you're vasodilated and it results in a hypotensive effect. But also, it results in the side effects of ACE inhibitors, this bradykinin, the cough and the angioedema that can be associated with it. A patient who gets started on an ACE inhibitor for the first time, for example, and is rushed to the emergency room with upper airway uh, swelling and, and uh, requires emergent intubation to protect their airway during this period of angioedema. ACE inhibitors via bradykinin can cause this. ACE inhibitors are often held uh, before surgery because of a worry of perioperative hypotension. And vasopressin seems to be uniquely useful in a situation where a patient took an ACE inhibitor preoperatively and then develops intractable hypotension in the perioperative period. Vasopressin can be used to raise the blood pressure. Some contraindications to ACE, renal artery stenosis and a history of angioedema in the past when treated with ACE inhibitors. Now ARBs, or angiotensin uh, blockers, receptor blockers, uh, work at the angiotensin receptor, not at the angiotensin converting enzyme. So the graphic at the right shows why ARBs, because they don't have that effect on uh, blocking bradykinin breakdown, would have less side effects, such as the cough and the angioedema. Beta-1 selective beta blockers um, have anti-ischemic effects, and they do that mainly by reducing myocardial oxygen demand because they reduce the contractility, but also increase the supply because they slow the heart rate and more time uh, is uh, occurring in diastole with slow heart rates, and that's when the coronaries on the left side of the heart are getting blood flow, so increasing the diastolic time. Esmol is a selective beta-1 blocker and we use it frequently in the perioperative period because it is so effervescent. It has a short half-life, only nine minutes. It's broken down by RBC red blood cell esterases. Metoprolol is a cardioselective uh, beta blocker, but it has a longer half-life than does Esmol of about three to four hours. Now, beta blockers in the perioperative period, there's been a fair amount of controversy in the past about the use of them. And in the POISE trial, although there's some issues with the authors, the perioperative administration of oral extended release metoprolol to patients that were not on beta blockers preoperative, they were beta blocker naive, was associated with an increased risk of stroke and mortality, but a decreased risk of non-fatal MI. So kind of good for the heart, but not so good for overall mortality and stroke to start a beta blocker in someone who was not on it preoperatively. There's also good evidence to suggest that we should not be withdrawing beta blockers if someone is on it preoperatively. We should be continuing it because they can reduce perioperative cardiac events. Let's move on now to amiodarone. Uh, amiodarone is used to treat refractory, both supraventricular and ventricular dysrhythmias. So it has a broad um, uh, indications for treatment of dysrhythmias. In the case of ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation, if you have V-fib resistant to defibrillation, uh, we give 300 milligrams IV, rapid dose, bolus. If there's a perfusion rhythm, we will give 150 milligrams IV over 10 minutes, repeating as necessary, and then start a maintenance infusion. Some of the adverse effects of amiodarone include the fact that it can vasodilate through its alpha blocking effects, it can have a negative inotropic effect, beta blocking effects, and the fact that it prolongs the QT interval and could result in torsades. 
It can cause sinus bradycardia or heart block, and if you use it long term, the lung, the eye, and the thyroid can be impacted. Pulmonary fibrosis, corneal microdeposits, and because it contains iodine, it can cause both hypo or hyperthyroidism. So the eye, the lung, and the thyroid can be affected by amiodarone. Torsades de points is a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. And the graphic on the top right, it has uh, polymorphic, that is, it has multiple shapes, not just one, like monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. And we usually think of it being associated with prolonged QT and then R on T occurring and then torsades. And torsades comes and goes, um, and often uh, you'll see a short run of torsades and then back into a normal rhythm often with a prolonged QT interval that may be associated with drugs like our antiemetics, including our 5-HT3 inhibitors that we use frequently in the uh, perioperative period for prophylaxis against postoperative nausea and vomiting. Torsades is associated uh, with hypomagnesemia, and so uh, administering magnesium to patients who are having polymorphic VTAC that is coming and going uh, may be helpful. If torsades occurs and it's unstable, you're going to defibrillate it. If it's stable and episodic coming and going, you can increase the heart rate pharmacologically or paced in an attempt to decrease the QT interval. You're obviously going to stop any medications that are prolonging the QT interval and administer magnesium, remembering that magnesium, if it's given as a bolus, can vasodilate and drop the blood pressure and uh, should be given over a period of time rather than rapid bolus. Um, <clears throat> lidocaine, uh, procainamide, uh, and amiodarone uh, may worsen torsades. So the specific treatment is uh, magnesium. So looking back at the keywords again in, as we end this session, from 2010 to 2018, inotropes, bradycardia, and heart transplant, you can see how beta agonists could increase the heart rate of a denervated heart that has still intact beta receptors, that norepinephrine is going to vasoconstrict, but also has beta-1 effects, that digoxin can cause toxicity, especially in the presence of hypokalemia, and digibine is specific uh, treatment for dig toxicity. The patient with it's nauseated, has GI upset, visual changes, cardiac dysrhythmias, who's on digoxin, digoxin toxicity can occur. Milrinone, because of its phosphodesterase type 3 inhibition, results in inotropy and vasodilation. So it's an inodilator, often combined with catecholamines like epinephrine or norepinephrine because of its synergistic effect. Vasopressors, vasopressin, its mechanism of action is V1 receptor, not alpha receptor. It works better than catecholamines in acidosis. The major cardiovascular effect is vasoconstriction. It's useful in vasoplegic states. In the case of septic shock, usually norepinephrine is the drug of first choice. Vasopressin may be added to reduce the dose of norepinephrine needed to provide requisite mean arterial pressure. Vasodilators, nitroprusside works through cyclic GMP as does nitroglycerin, um, and its toxicity is associated with the cyanide ion which met hemoglobin uh, can bind cyanide as can sulfur and form thiocyanate in the case of uh, the sulfur donor that is used as an antidote. Vasodilators can be used to treat valvular insufficiency medically such as severe AI or severe MR as you prepare patients for more definitive procedures like valve replacement. There are alpha blockers like fentolamine there are uh, drugs like phenoldepam that works via the D1 receptor and raises renal blood flow and drops blood pressure. We have nitric oxide that we can inhale and cause selective pulmonary vascular resistance decrease and to treat pulmonary hypertension, but it doesn't have effect on systemic vascular resistance. And sildenafil, a uh, PGE5 inhibitor that is used to um, drop pulmonary vascular resistance and to improve blood flow in the case of erectile dysfunction. ACE and ARBs, ACE inhibitors, 
work through an inhibition of the ACE enzyme and can cause side effects like cough and angioedema because of the bradykinin effect and ARBs have less side effects because they don't affect the bradykinins like the ACE inhibitors do. Beta blockers can reduce ischemia of the heart because they slow the heart rate, reduce contractility, decrease oxygen requirements, and improve um, oxygen supply to the heart. Antidysrhythmics, amiodarone we touched on, and how it can be used to treat both SVT and VT. Torsades, when it occurs, um, we think of avoiding the drugs that prolong the QT interval and uh, providing magnesium as a selective treatment uh, for torsades to points. In the case of PGE1, it is a uh, prostaglandin that is used to keep the ductus open in patients that need ductal blood flow who have congenital heart disease. And as mentioned at the beginning, this will be touched on in another a didactic section. I hope that you learned something from this discussion of cardiovascular pharmacology based on key words and I hope you have a great day and never stop learning. This picture is a picture from uh, a recent bike trip I took from Seattle down to San Francisco with my tent and sleeping bag about a thousand miles of uh, coastline. It was a wonderful trip. If you ever get a chance to see the coastline of Oregon Oregon and Northern California, I'd highly advise it. Have a great day.